Final fact, the existence of the empty tomb. Gary Habermas has surveyed the material written by scholars on the resurrection and has found that 75% of them accept the tomb was found empty on Easter morning. For example, skeptical scholar Jacob Kremer says, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. The evidence for this is simply overwhelming. However, some scholars like John Dominic Crossan do not think Jesus was buried in a tomb, but thrown in a trench for dogs to eat because the Romans would not have allowed a proper burial for criminals. But such a theory flies in the face of a mountain of evidence. First, Dale Allison, who is skeptical of physical resurrection, points out the word in the creed in 1 Corinthians 15 for bury would rarely be used for dumping of criminals in a trench for dogs to eat. So the earliest account of the burial of Jesus would be incompatible with Crossan's argument. We also have multiple attestation crucified victims were buried and two different sources say Jesus was buried. We also have archaeological evidence a crucified victim received a proper burial, and there is no reason to think the Romans would not have allowed this practice. They were certainly okay with allowing other Jewish practices to go on in Jerusalem, such as temple worship, which they detested because it meant a rejection of Roman gods. They allowed the Jews to conduct their own trials, have their own temple guards, keep the Sabbath, and so forth. There is no reason they would not have allowed this as well, and it fits with archaeological and textual evidence. Jesus' burial not only has multiple attestation, but it meets the criteria of embarrassment, since they say he was buried in the tomb of a Sanhedrin member, which would have been dishonoring for his followers. Such a group had just murdered their lord, and now they needed to bum a tomb for him from one of its own members? To the public, this would have looked pretty humiliating, and the fact that they mention he was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea means the tomb was public knowledge, and its whereabouts were known. So the public at any time would have known about it and could have readily debunked it if the tomb was not empty. But the account of the empty tomb is also embarrassing because it was discovered by women, and we have already discussed this is not something you would have made up. Matthew also mentions the competing theory that the disciples stole the body. This is odd because why would Matthew want to mention the competing theory, which could possibly stir up doubt among the people he was trying to convert? Justin Martyr, writing later, has to respond to this theory because it was the official story Jews were telling people, which is an interesting admission because it says the body could not be found. If the Sanhedrin still had the body, they could have had Gentiles bring it out for them and show the tomb was never empty. But the Christians never had to respond to this charge, so both sides agreed the body was missing. Finally, we have the Nazareth inscription a stone found in the area, and it has written on it an imperial decree from around 41 AD, which says that the penalty for grave robbing was death, which is interesting because it is very severe for how Romans punish thieving. The Romans would not normally give such a high penalty for stealing something, but this would make sense with the rise of Christianity and what Suetonius tells us. In Rome, there were riots among the Jews on accounts of Crestus, which was a common Roman mispronunciation of Christ and eventually Claudius expelled all the Jews because of it. If some Jews in Rome were preaching Christ was resurrected and riots resulted from it, and the tomb was not empty, there would be no need for an imperial decree because they could just produce the body. But because the only alternative explanation was the body was missing because it was stolen, Rome's only option would be to issue a decree to try to combat the accounts of a missing body. If there was a body, then Rome could have just dispelled the riots with the body and not have to indirectly admit the body went missing. So it appears to be that from all sides the body was missing. Either way, there's no evidence the empty tomb was just a fabrication. And this is why most scholars today accept the tomb was found empty. All the evidence simply favors it. So if the body was stolen, who did it? Would Rome? Of course not, because they would not have cared. How about the Jewish leaders? Why would they? They wanted Jesus crucified, shamed, buried, and forgotten. The last thing they wanted was suspicion of him coming back to life. Of course, the Sanhedrin claimed it was the disciples, but that is unlikely. Their rabbi had just been crucified and their movement was dispersed and shamed. They were in fear the Jewish authorities would come after them as well. There is no reason to think they would have been in the position to steal a body and create a mass hoax. Second, if they had stolen the body, there is little reason to think they would have reported the theory that Jewish leaders were spreading. If it was true, the last thing they would have wanted was to help spread the rumor they had stolen the body. And if they had stolen the body, they would not have reported to their shame and dishonor that they had not believed the reports of the women when they found the empty tomb. 
nor would they have embarrassingly reported that they had not understood that Jesus had predicted his rise. These were very embarrassing and shameful things to report. Later, Christians would not have made this up and attacked the honor and authority of their leaders, nor would have the disciples unless they wanted to shame themselves. And most of all, where would they have taken the body? A common overlooked fact is that this was Passover and the city was flooded with pilgrims. They would have been seen and they would have been caught. It would have been very hard to pull off, especially getting the body out of the Sanhedrin section of town. So for the conspiracy theory to work, you need to deposit the disciples were in fear for their lives, yet somehow decided to steal the body and fake a resurrection, even though none of them were expecting that. Then they managed to get the body out of the Sanhedrin section of town where the tombs were and hide it in an overcrowded city. The entire theory becomes overwhelmingly unlikely. The hallucination theory doesn't work either. Did the entire population of Jerusalem hallucinate? So the theory it was not really discovered empty fails as well. What about the mythic theory? Some have tried to claim the empty tomb was made up later because it is not specifically mentioned in the creed Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians. Well, this just ignores the amount of evidence we already gave. And that the empty tomb and physical resurrection are both mentioned in the early passion narrative found in Mark. But most of all, it overlooks what the creed in 1 Corinthians says. It says, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and raised. It is pretty obvious that what was buried is what was raised, and therefore the tomb would have been empty. As N.T. Wright says, The fact that the empty tomb itself, so prominent in the gospel accounts, does not appear to be specifically mentioned in this passage, is not significant. The mention here of buried and raised no more need to be amplified in that way than one would need to amplify the statement, I walk down the street with the qualification on my feet. So the mythic theory fails here as well. But there is one theory that can account for all the data, and it is the theory that Jesus was raised and vindicated by God. No other theory out there can account for all the data. Ehrman tries to say the corpse of Jesus simply rotted away so no one could go and check. But this is untenable since the bones of Jesus would have remained and people knew of the location of the tomb that was used. They would have known if a body was still there. Ehrman even admits during this debate that the women followers of Jesus watched from afar so they knew where the body was and would have known if the tomb was empty or not. We also need to remember the tomb was in the Sanhedrin section of town, so the remains would have been in their presence, so they could have pulled them out at any time and provided witnesses to counteract the witnesses the tomb was empty. But we never see this as something the Christians needed to respond to. All the evidence indicates the tomb was found empty. This is also backed up even more by the fact that the evidence shows the tomb was found empty just three days later by women followers. The majority of scholars accept this because it meets the criteria of embarrassment, being that it was first discovered by women. No early Jew would make this up in such a male-centered culture. Because of this, most scholars accept this piece of data as authentic, and the tomb was found empty just three days later. Ehrman has, in other debates, said he thinks this could be just a mythic invention and not rule out that it could have been invented. But this is ad hoc and hardly a response. As we have already discussed, the mythic theory cannot explain this. So Ehrman cannot explain the empty tomb as a later invention or decomposition. First being that the empty tomb is a later myth that was added on. There is so much evidence for the tomb being empty, it is hard to dismiss. And we've already beat this enough. 